Hi, everyone. This is Ray Luskin, award-winning author, artist, activist, and creative mindfulness mentor. And I'm so excited you're here today to join us for Women Who Dare. Today, my guest is Pat LaMarche, and she's an author, an educator, an award-winning broadcaster, and a journalist. And she has been um, working on the issues of homelessness and uh, alleviating poverty in this country for a very long time. And I do want to talk a little bit about your run for vice president at some point. Just uh, she was running with the Green Party in 2004. So she's a true activist and, and, the, and a creative activist in the most amazing way. So welcome, Pat. Thank you. Thanks. My, my studio uh, office here in my car. <laughs> Well, we all have issues. There are times, yes, you know, it's like, so it's okay. Um, I have to tell you, she's coming home from a rally that was in Maine. And so she sort of lost track of time and it's a six hour drive. So we're just going to let it go for today and enjoy her conversation. So, cause she breathes and lives the work that she's doing. And that's what I admire so much about you. Um, how did you get started in this arena? What was it that inspired you to work in this area? Well, my mother was an Irish immigrant, uh, children of, of Irish immigrants, a child of Irish immigrants. And uh, I don't ever remember not hearing about poverty and hunger. You know, I mean, my, my family literally fled the famines. And uh, we, I used to joke with her that I could really enjoy the meal better if I didn't always hear about someone who didn't have a meal while I was trying to enjoy it. Um, but that's the way she was. She just, she couldn't be happy knowing other people were unhappy. And so we were always doing things, rolling pennies. You know, she'd collect pennies, we'd roll pennies and we'd give them to people who needed the money or to the missions or to the, she was, you know, an Irish Catholic. So there was all that. But um, so my whole life was just sort of paying attention to that. And I became a journalist after school and um, I started out in TV and radio and print. I always joke that I turned 35, put on 20 pounds and went straight from TV to radio. <laughs> I turned 45, 20 more pounds and I went to print. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. That was really good. Okay. But, um, but so I did a lot of media. I did most of my reporting was on poverty also. And um, so, I mean, I've reported from all over the world, uh, the dumps of Guatemala where children fight with dogs for scraps of food. You know, the United States doesn't have the most extreme poverty. It just has the most unnecessary poverty. Um, and so I, I just had this incredible experience of being able to have my work reflect the ethics with which my mom brought us up. Um, and, uh, and it was, you know, I've, because I was a radio disc jockey, after a while, a morning show host job is to think of the stupidest possible thing and then say it. Um, and so you do stupid human tricks. I lived in an A19 M40 Abrams tank every year for Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know, and, uh, right, right. and collected food for the hungry for the holidays, you know. So I just, I was always able to sort of work my passion into my job. Well, and it sounds like I was reading that, you know, even when you were single and struggling, you always made time for service that it was so important. And I believe in that, the idea that we all have something to contribute. You know, in your case, you were feeding the homeless once a month. And, and too often we think we're, we don't have anything to give. And that's really sad because sometimes the biggest gift we can give is just listening, you yeah. know? And, and um, you know, I, I know for myself, where I grew up, you know, I've been very blessed and there's just not a lot of, you know, homeless people. There were like three in the neighborhood. And, you know, I would walk the dog in the park and this one man was rooting through the garbage. I, so I went, and I got him a jewel card and I pretty much threw it, threw it at him because that was the closest grocery store. Because like, I don't know, is he crazy? Is he this, is he that, you know, and it was, and, but I kept seeing him over and over. And then one day I, we actually had a conversation in the library. He loved to read and he'd sit in the library and he'd read. And he said, I hope you're not mad at me. I said, well, why? He said, I use part of my money and I could have cried. To, you, to buy dog biscuits for the dogs in the park. Yeah. You know, here is somebody who has nothing who can still do something. And I think that's what we've lost sight of, that we all have that ability by just witnessing and hearing other people's stories and how important these stories are to be heard. Well, you touched on a really important thing. Well, two, two really important things. I always joke that I'm a buzzkill. 
You want to talk to me about stuff by the time I'm done, you'll be weeping. Yeah, It'll be a yeah. terrible experience. But you gave that man two things. Well, you mentioned mentoring, which is the most important gift you can give anyone. Right. But you gave him joy. He didn't just get dog biscuits for the park. He got joy because he was able to give them the biscuits in the park. Right. And and that gift of joy is so understated and in the undervalued and underthought about when you think about helping someone. Right. You know, and and there are for every one homeless individual that you can see, one person experiencing homelessness, there are 999 who will never let you know that they are. Right. And they, that you may work with them and they tell you here, drop me off here. I'll walk the rest of the way or drop me off here. That's my house. You pull out. They, this is not their house, right? right. There, there's an, so much shame attached to homelessness that you never really get the story, um, the whole story. And, and they're probably waited on you today at a fast food joint. You know, um, my anecdotally, 55% of the people that were in my shelters over the last decade had an income. They had a job. 30% more were their children. So 85% of the people in the shelters I ran were the working poor and their kids. That's mm. not the message we're told. Right. Right. And it's not the message we really want to believe because we're really nice people. And it's heartbreaking to think that, eight, that 85% of the people in shelters are the working poor and their kids. Oh, and if it could happen to them, it could happen to me. And right. that's frightening. Right. And people don't want to hear that story. I mean, I love to collect stories of how, you know, what we can do in a little way. There was a man that I, I he, he was a musician. And one day he was walking past a homeless woman. And he walked right by her and he came back and he said, can I give you some money? And she said, no. She said, I could use a hug. Oh. And he gave her a hug and he gave her his card. And six months later, she called him and said, I hadn't been touched in a year. You made all the difference. And now I've got a job. And he also, as a musician, wrote a song about hugs that was then the anthem for a charity. It works that way. If we allow ourselves to do that and spend time, I learned more from this man than I could believe. I didn't know anything at that time. I didn't know you had a wish list on Amazon and, you know, and he showed me his and I, I was able to support him in different ways. Yeah. But one of the, one of the moments he called me, you know, we, we, we were friends. And before he got a job, and that was a blessing, um, he was in the park one night and a woman stumbled in drunk and lay on the ice and snow. And if he had not called the, you know, the paramedics, she would have been dead. Right. And, you know, it's like he was there for a reason, you know, and that was like after that, then he found a job. And then, you know, you never know. I, I do believe in those kind of things that we're here for a reason. And yeah. So. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it was it was one people call me all the time. There's a homeless person or there's a person that appears to be homeless and he's in the median and it's 10 below out. Should I put him in my car? And the answer is no. Do not put a stranger in your car. Call that person an ambulance. You know, an, an old guy in the median at 10 below doesn't need your car. He needs a real facility. Call right. the ambulance and don't feel bad about it. Right. You know, good on you for wanting to help, but there are ways to help that are not at risk so, sharing. So what are some of the best ways we can help? I mean, because we have a lot of issues here. It's so much more than, you know, we, we have all these children out there on their own right now. You know, the kids who have left home because they're, you know, they're, they're different. Their parents kicked them out the sex traffic kids. So there's, there's this whole world it, it, that's, a, that's like a shadow world that we don't talk about. And how do we make a difference? And how, what are some of your ideas for changing that scenario? Well, everybody needs to find the thing that is most comfortable for them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I never, I never want anyone to do something that is uncomfortable. And I'm not a big shame person. I don't think people should be shamed into action. I think people need to embrace what's comfortable. I applaud you for hugging that or that person for hugging that person because it's really hard to hug someone you don't know. It's it's is way outside my comfort zone. Oh, mine too, for you sure. Know? And and so people who can do that, every single thing that you can do that you feel comfortable with, that's what you need to be concentrating on. I really love the idea of going to a local shelter and asking if you're a if you're a, an adult a capable, healthy adult with a decent uh, surroundings of your own, 
um, and you say, I'd like to mentor a family. You know, there are families who the world has changed a little because of COVID or entirely. A yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot. Um, yeah. But there are a lot of people who can't go to the grocery store. They just don't have a way to get there. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you go through an agency that's already interfacing with people and or or you can go to your local school department and say, can I speak with the homeless liaison? Every single school department is mandated by the federal government to have one staff member that does nothing but facilitate the education of kids who are experiencing homelessness. And you I didn't know that. That's really important that people know that. That's fabulous. And if you go to Schoolhouse Connection, um, they do have a spreadsheet. You have to dig through their website. They're wonderful people. I think it's schoolhouseconnection.org. Um, but they have a spreadsheet and you can look up your town and who the homeless liaison wow. is. Okay. But, I mean, but it's a big spreadsheet because it's a pretty big country. Yeah. Um, but, but then and you can find your homeless liaison and you can say, is there a family I can mentor? And you don't have to meet the family if it's uncomfortable. You can say, I need to know if those kids need socks, shoes. Let me know what the kids need. What size do they wear? And you can remain completely anonymous. Yeah. You know, there are all levels of that, you know, and, and there's no way to help too little. And, and people don't have to feel like they've got to change the whole everything. <laughs> right. It, it's part. Yeah. 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 Don't, don't think you're going to. There was a 10 year plan to end homelessness during my career. There was a five year plan to end veteran homelessness. <laughs> you know, you know, the big giant agencies aren't ending it. Um, right now, there's a lot of money out there. So actually, they don't need money as badly as they need time, effort, and energy, which oh, is a really short supply because COVID's scary. Right, right. Right? Right. And, you know, I mean, it's interesting because you talk about that. I, I belong to the National Council of Jewish Women, and, you know, we have what we call luggage for freedom. So we pack suitcases, you know, with with that, or we have backpacks with school supplies for kids who don't, and we do it like twice a year kind of thing because yeah there are things you can do and there are local organizations that are doing that if you want to contribute yes COVID has changed it we used to have intergenerational packing which was phenomenal so you know you had all these families coming and it was great and obviously with COVID it can't be the same way but you know hopefully in another year things will change back yeah. and we can do some of these things but yeah I I, I love that what I wanted to ask, okay, let's ask about your run for vice president. What was that like? And what prompted you to do that? Um, well, I mean, I'll try to make this a short story, which yeah. is um, I, in, in 1998, I ran for governor of the state of Maine. And I did incredibly well. I was on CNN for having the cheapest votes in the country, I should say the least expensive. Um, we raised and spent $20,000 and we got about 40,000 votes. Well, 50 cents a vote is, you know, there are, there are races that people are spending hundreds of dollars a vote and they're getting many more votes, but they're, they're spending millions of dollars on races. So we were sort of um, held up as, an, as a, uh, an example of how good ideas and speaking a sort of truth to power can really raise some attention. And I never doubted or thought or daydreamed that I would win, but I was trying to get a new political system. So winning for me was having a third political party. Now, a, lot, a lot of people get very, 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 very nervous about that because we don't have a parliament in this country. We have a winner take all system, but that is actually changing with instant runoff voting, which was just done in New York City where you can rank the choices of the people that you want. And so if you're a first place person doesn't win, they go to your second place choice until someone has a clear majority. Those are ways that you can have more choice. So your only two choices aren't an incumbent that's been there for 16 years and is on the take or a <laughs> radical whack job who wants to run against them, yeah. right? And so they're both in the two major parties. So you've got to take one of them. Well, if we had the ranked choice voting and you could say, okay, I have this person that matches my ideals. I'm going to rank her first. And then I'll vote for the whack job crazy because this guy's on the take, you know? And so that way you still get your, your second vote will count if that ideal doesn't win. But the thing is, if people can start voting their ideals, the ideals will win. Right, right. right. 
So, well, and right now you've got so many people in the country who want, you know, who are in favor of things, but they can't get them passed in, you know, in the Senate. Right. So yeah, it's that same thing. It's yet the majority of people want it, but the party doesn't. So right. yeah. Um, what I what I love when I read this was that you actually stayed in homeless shelters during your campaign. Um, I think that that again is one of those creative ideas. Um, I live in Chicago, and and Mayor Jane Byrne went and lived in um, HUD housing, you know, before her, you know, as part of that. But it was like a week, you know. So, but it, it was like eye opening at the time. Nobody had ever done anything like that to bring attention to issues that really mattered. Yeah, I had, I I was in a, I stayed in the south side of Chicago, uh, in a shelter, and I remember when the people dropped me off at the shelter to stay there, and every and everyone knew who I was and what I was doing, and I I never took a bed from a person who needed it because that was the bottom line. I slept on the floor in places, because it would have been a really horrible thing to have said, "Give me a bed." Right, right. right. <laughs> um. So, but when I got to that shelter and they dropped me off. The man said to me, if this shelter burns down, I want you to stay inside. Do not go outside. It's not safe. And I wow. don't know if that was hyperbole or if that was the truth, but I know that he felt he, uh, he was taking me to a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. And I felt sorry for him. I wasn't afraid, but he was afraid. Interesting. And, and the man who was the night watchman of this shelter this women's shelter I stayed at another thing that you could do if you if you're looking for something to do is you could bring um, hygiene products you know tampons sanitary right. pads, things like that are so necessary um, so anyway he he came up to me afterwards and I had had this crazy night it, it was just I mean it's all in my book um, but it was crazy and uh, well tell them the title of your book so <laughs> oh, uh, well, the book I wrote initially was called Left Out in America, okay. but it's now a 15 year adaptation it has the original book in the back for free, but it's called Still Left Out in America. But um, it's, it's now that I've run shelters myself, it's the how, how does HUD react? How does FEMA react? How does the Department of Education react? What about Meals on Wheels? No homeless people don't qualify for that. You know, what is going on with this with the system? But at that night, this man came up to me afterwards um, and he, he was a black man and he said to me, it had been a tumultuous night. And the man who dropped me off was afraid of everybody in this neighborhood. And he came up to me and he said, you know what I really love? And I said, what? He said, flowers. I said, flowers, that's cool. I, I, I like flowers too. He said, you know why I love flowers? And I said, no, why? And he said, because it doesn't matter what color they are. Oh, oh, love right? that. He yeah. was telling me, we don't care what color you are. Yeah. We're glad you're here. Right. And it was so here's the night watchman whose job is to protect these women going out of his way to make me feel comfortable. Right. I really love that. that. That's a beautiful story. That is really incredible. Um, I'd love to talk to you now about how you have now written these children's books about Priscilla that that, you know, the, your, the fourth one is launching soon. So I want you to give everybody information. But tell them about this series and why you wrote it and and you know about Priscilla. So well I mentioned I'm a buzzkill. I'm also a broken record. <laughs> so I'm a just a cliche. Yeah, but broken <laughs> records that's the squeaky wheel syndrome. You know, you hope the ripples come out and that somebody's listening because you know, I, I mean, I read about it in Ms. Magazine about you and the, and the Priscilla's and, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, that was very cool. And, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's like, you just don't know where somebody's going to hear about you or, he, you know, or find you for anything. And so I think it's so cool, you know? Yeah. You know, for someone who um, ran for vice president and did lose by 53 million votes to a man who shot his friend in the face, that hurts. <laughs> really. um, but, you have a but, great um, sense of humor. I love your <laughs> sense of humor. But uh, being in Ms. Magazine was probably the biggest honor I've ever had because I remember when Ms. Magazine started and it was, it was a magazine about women who do stuff. It was like your show, right? It was this, let's focus on people who, who have the guts and the gumption to do what people think they can't do. And so being in Ms. Magazine this year, all these years later, was such a huge, a huge thrill. Um, but 
I was, I'm a broken record who talks about really sad things like homelessness. And my grandson said to me, he's about six at the time, why don't you write a chapter book about homelessness for kids like me, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, that's a great idea. Why don't I write a chapter book about kids for kids like you? And it has since been compared to the Laura Ingalls Wilder books. Okay. Because I Little House on the Prairie was about food insecurity, housing insecurity. You know, you go to the frontier and, you know, your family almost starves to death like the Ingalls did. The difference in those books and my book is there's no racism in my books. <laughs> you know, it was very anti-Indian, those books. And the second thing that's similar is there's a frontier, but it's on the street corner. It's in the park, like you're talking about. It's at the truck stop where families go to take showers. The frontier is now all across the United States in every community. And so the Priscilla books are just the story about these five little kids who fall in love with this woman who hangs out in the park and teaches them about birds and flowers. And then as the story unfolds, you come to learn that she lives there. And then you come to learn that a couple of the kids are living in a national park. And then you start to say, oh, wait a minute, this is homelessness. And so it, it kind of creeps up on you. And so I like to say it's for kids from eight to 80, because I really hope parents read them with their children. Right. And this, this is the age range. My grandchildren are 10 down to three. So yeah, I definitely, yeah. So let's talk about how COVID affected one of your books and what you, how you brought that together. That I thought was really interesting when I read about that about yeah. Bishop's Gambit? Yeah, so the third installment of the Priscilla books, and there'll be four, the fourth one is out in November for Homeless Awareness Month. Um, I'm gonna just open my car door a little bit because it's warming up in here. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to ignore the pandemic, but I didn't. And you know, I've gotten some interesting feedback from some children who read it. And one child who was just waiting for the third episode to come out, the third book to come out, she, she said her mother told me that they got to the third chapter and she said, the pandemic's in this, I don't want to read it. Mm. I thought, oh no, right? I don't want to, I mean, these kids have had enough of the pandemic, but then she and her mom talked about it for about a half hour and she said, I want to know what happens. So the mom said, do you want to keep reading? So they did and they ended up finishing the book and, you know, because I used the pandemic because it was in real life, it had a major impact on homelessness. Um, and the little girl digested the fact that it is part of reality right now. So it was mm -hmm. interesting. This girl was young. She was probably nine. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know how, you know, I think my 10 year old would be okay with this. She's an avid reader and everything. And so we've had some discussions about serious stuff. So yeah, I didn't know really how much because you know, the idea, you know, about taking your children away and all that, that that's a heavy duty topic for young kids. Right. And there's in the fourth book, which comes out in November. Um, What's the title? And where can they find it? Uh, uh, Priscilla's picnic with the president. Okay. Um, and uh, if you go to um, patlamarsh.com, it, all the books are available through that, um, or it sends you either to the big power retailers, or you can buy it through a local bookstore if that's what you prefer. Okay. I didn't want to just put like Amazon up there. I wanted to give people an option. Um, but uh, in the fourth book, it, I, I, it deals with domestic violence. And I did have a, psych, a psychologist read it. And the important thing to me about these books is not only that kids and parents learn about homelessness, but that kids experiencing homelessness see themselves in a book. Because there are 1.5 million homeless school children according to the Department of Education, and, and they need to not be the odd man out. You know, they, they need to not be an anomaly. They need to see that they're just, it's just unfortunately way too common in the United States right now. And and there can be heroes in a book and they are heroes in the book. These kids are great heroes and role models and, and Priscilla's, Priscilla's just lovable. She's, you know, she's a conglomeration of about 10 people I've known in my life. Right, so, and, and you happen to say in one of the interviews that she, she, she herself, the Priscilla character is now not on the street anymore. Right, the, the first woman I met who is nothing like the character in the book because the real Priscilla that I know has serious problems. 
okay. that are taking full time help. <laughs> um, but it was her name, you know, was, this woman was living in the park in my in my town and the police would try and shove her along and she wouldn't go. And she had so many fears that she feared the police less. And so, so I was talking to a bunch of the guys experiencing homelessness that I've known for a decade, you know, I've made sandwiches for. And I said, what's up with the chick in the park? And they said, well, Priscilla, she ain't going nowhere. She won't. I said, what about the cops? She said, no, the cops don't bother her. She won't move. I said, who does she think she is? The princess of the park? <laughs> and it's Great stuck. title. Instant <laughs> title. I love it. Yeah. 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 So she's a, she's a really lovable person. She and I go for walks together. She buys me gifts. But, you know, it's, it's really when you have a close friend who's experiencing homelessness, it really grounds you because like Christmas time last year, you know, the books of lifesavers. Mm -hmm. She bought me the book, a book of lifesavers. And with it, she gave me 10 Ziploc bags because when you live outside, you have to put each packet of lifesavers in its own Ziploc bag or they get drenched. Okay. And they get ruined and you can't appreciate your lifesavers anymore. So she didn't just give me the box. She gave me the 10 bags I need to live outside. That. Yeah. 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 There's a lot to learn from They're the most resourceful people in the world. I know yeah. it was interesting in our community. There were a bunch of, you know, in a networking group I was part of the men went downtown to under the viaduct where there's a, an encampment and the people said, we don't want what you have. We need this and sent them home and said, we need this. And they actually bought what they needed and brought it back. But it was pretty eye opening. You know, they had this expectation. We all do. This is what they need, you know, and rather than, yeah, yeah. than what they really and, actually need. And the other thing that we wonder is why, where's their family? Why isn't their family helping them? And one of the chapters in my book, Still Left Out in America, talks about elder orphans and how many elders get to old age and don't have anyone. Mm. And statistically about 35% of the people who have Alzheimer's don't even go to the hospital. They suffer with Alzheimer's at home. So if you're suffering like that and you don't have a home, yeah. you know, then what do you do? Right. So there are all these issues that sometimes people don't have anybody or the people they do have are just as poor as they are. You know, it's not someone from the upper middle class who fell to homelessness. It's someone who lives on the margin in Jeepers. If I move in with my mom and my, I bring my three kids, her landlord's going to throw her out. He rented to a little old lady and now he's got three generations living there. We're out on the street. You know, I've had so many moms and grandmoms call me at the shelter and say, I'm so sorry my grandchildren are there. I would help them if I could. And I say, well, you know, you can visit them all you want. You don't need to apologize to me. Yeah. You know, I'm in the housing business, not the judging business. Because if I was in the judging business, the entire U.S. Senate wouldn't have a house. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Um, I just want to, you know, talk, where, where do you see yourself in another few years? What is it that you would like to accomplish? What's the legacy you'd like to leave? Jeez, that's a lot of questions. Okay, it's a lot of questions. Pick <laughs> one to answer. How's that? Um, the legacy, I guess, is, I mean, I'd like just to, I just like to have people understand that a very small thing makes a very big difference. And, and it's really possible. My email address is epicjourney10 at gmail.com. Um, I'll answer any questions you have. I'll help you any way I can. Um, you can do what I do. You don't have to do what I do. Um, I can tell you who does what I do and you can help them. Um, but it's easy to do a little something. And if we all did, the other thing is we need to love each other. Yeah. <laughs> love, yeah. Love is really important. Um, where do I see myself? You know, I just don't know. And I kind of been wondering about that because the Priscilla series ends now. Well, it's interesting that you picked domestic violence as your last one in that series. Because my, in my mind, all of a sudden, I could see more, you know, <laughs> going forward. Yeah. There are so many topics to include, you know, about education, you know, and what do we do when we don't have a computer and the kids who are sitting in their car all sharing one computer and all that. I mean, it was sort of like my mind, there is a lot more that could be covered <laughs> under this you know, yeah. yeah, I think I just need another, uh, another venue, another focus, because uh, I don't, 
I, if I move on with the, with the Priscilla series, I need to take Joey, who's a, uh, an unaccompanied youth teenager who's starting college. You know, there are, there are age groups, uh, uh, foster kids who age out of homelessness, which is what Joey is in the book. There are other people who could become the character. Sure. Yeah. The, the last thing that I've been working on that comes out on Veterans Day is um, a man, a, a, a pretty famous comic book artist who does the Necromance series of zombies, called me up and asked me if I would write a comic book he could draw about a homeless superhero. And I said, I will if it can be a veteran. So this is about a homeless superhero veteran, and I've never done a comic book in my oh, wow. life. I have goosebumps. When you said that, I have goosebumps. I'm telling you, that is like, wow. Yeah. So I, I'm thinking I'd like to do another one of those, and I want my veteran to be a mommy, a female veteran with two little kids, modeled after a woman I knew in the shelter who was a desalination specialist in Iraq and came home and there was nothing for her. And, wow. and I want her to be my next superhero. So that might be where I'm going. Okay, well, it's really interesting because I love how you're taking all your, your stories because I think that's really what you're here about, telling stories that we all can relate to or if we can't relate to it, it opens our eyes and creates awareness. And that's why I'm telling stories today. That's why I'm doing this, you know, this series because I believe in the power of story to change lives personally and around the globe. So thank you so much, Pat. I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope to hear more. Can't wait to check out all this wonderful new stuff that you're, you're going to be producing. And everyone, this is Ray Luskin. And, you know, I love the quote by Helen Keller who said, alone we can do so little, but, a lo but together we can do so much. And this is about us getting together and doing so much. So thank you, everyone. I so appreciate your time, Pat. Thank you. It's an honor. <laughs>